My name is Petya Dimitrova, and my colleagues, they will uh, introduce themselves. Yeah, my name is Clifford Erimi Ogai. And I'm happy at Kegbele, yeah? Um, yes, we won't take too much of your time just uh, uh, to identify your presence. Uh, you are warmly welcome, and I hope you will enjoy the evening. Eine schöne Abend. Danke sehr. Good evening. My name is Belinda Kasim Kaminski. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you all tonight at the Wien Museum. I'm very happy that you all showed up. We, are, we will not only discuss, but we will be listening to music as we have before. We will have deep conversations, I hope, and also enjoy a nice buffet in the end. Our theme today is Nigerians in Vienna, perspectives from different generations. So I'm also very happy to be able to introduce you to our guests. Each of them was invited due to their numerous contributions in various cultural, political, youth-based organizations in Austria and in Germany. I guess I can speak for the organizers uh, of this evening that we are really very, very happy that you were all able to make it. And we are looking forward to share our different perspectives. I will start by introducing Adoro Ofuedu. Thanks for coming. She is active in various organizations in Vienna, for example, the Black Women's Community, the Igbo Women's Association, Anamba Community Vienna and Nanka, the National Association of the Nigerian Community in Austria. She studies medicine and works at the Red Cross in Vienna. She has been part of the team of, Afri of the African Cultural Festival, AfriCult, since the beginning. And together with her sister, Ifeoma Melissa, she has organized a lot of projects for Afri Youth and the African Literature Festival, Afrikanische Literaturtage. And if you ask yourself why her face is familiar to you, she is also the nominee for the federal chancellor in a campaign of the AVP, Afrika Vernetzungsplattform, named Frau Dr. Brückenbauer. And she was also part of a photo work by the Austrian artist Liesl Ponger, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Women's Day. Thanks for coming again. I would also like to introduce you to Ms. Oya Iro Amenagwa Won Bright, who is an outspoken human rights activist. On the 5th of May 1998, she founded the Verein ICAO, Afrikanische Informations- und Kommunikationsaktive. From the year 2000 to 2004, she was a spokesperson of the Chamber of Labor, which represents the interest of 3.5 million employees and consumers in Austria for the list of the BDFA, Bunte Demokratie für Alle. She was very active in various organizations like Nanka, Black Women's Community, and LEFE, which is an association by and for migrant women that responds to migrant women's diversified and complex needs and has been working in the fields of sex, sex work and human trafficking. In 2002, she was a candidate of the Communist Party for the European elections in Vienna. Thanks for being our guest. Thank you. Let me further introduce you to Mr. Sande Olalade, alias coach. He is one of the leading figures in the Nigerian community. He migrated to Vienna as a student in the 70s and graduated from the Moller Technical Schule in 1982. He was the first to organize sport activities for African migrants in Austria, for example, football and tennis tournaments like the Vienna African Cup of Nations. He is currently retired after 34 years of work, but nevertheless very active in the community. Currently, he serves as the Vice President of the Nigerian Elders Forum Vienna. Thanks a lot for coming. And last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Rex Osa. Thanks for joining us. You arrived today from Germany. 
Rex also is active in self-organized movements of migrants and refugees, namely the Voice Refugee Forum, the Caravan for Rights of Refugees and Migrants, and the network Refugees for Refugees based in Stuttgart. 2010, he was part of the Break the Isolation campaign, which he co-initiated with the Voice Refugee Forum in order to make the conditions of refugees known to a larger public. As you have noticed, I guess, Rex also is the only guest from Germany today. Nevertheless, due to his amazing and important work in the field of refugee rights, the organizers decided to invite him as he will be able to give us insights on the topic of self-organized um, refugee work. Thank you for coming. So my plan for this evening was to make a first round of questions where we will get to know you more, but also we'll be able to connect to what we see here at the exhibitions. And I hope that others uh, have, some of you have already been at the barbershop to also see it in a full place. Um, as we have said before, this project is interested in an intergenerational dialogue that brings together people from Nigeria or with a biography connected to Nigeria. Intergenerational as the exhibi exhibition was grouped around the timeline according to decades starting from the 60s, gathering voices of people that came to Austria, respectively Germany at different times. A lot of information sometimes doesn't get passed on from one generation to the other. So what we have here when looking at the exhibition is the pos possibility to see parallels, similarities, differences and to see how our um, personal or individual experiences are connected to a structural level of politics, law, economy, immigration politics. And this again, I think, is very useful when thinking about our needs in the here and now, about organizing and about our future. So let me start with you, Coach. You came to Austria in the 70s, as I said, as a student, and I just want to add some rough time frame. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nigeria gained independence in the 1960s and became part of the UN. In 1956-57, the first students from Nigeria enrolled in Austrian universities. 1963, the Austrian embassy opened in Lagos. So just that we have a little bit of information about that time too. From the 1960s on, um, there were apprenticeship positions at the ÖGB with the program of the International Forum. Um, these were discontinued until the mid-1970s. So, um, in the 1970s, one of the meeting places that uh, people went to was the Afro, the Albert Schweitzer House, and the University's Cafeteria. Coach, what were the things that you were confronted with by the time? Uh, how was the political climate? How easy was it to study, or how difficult was it to study as a Nigerian student? Good evening. So as a Nigerian student in the 77 upward, which I knew, is not so difficult because as an African, not only Nigerian, if you come to Austria, unless you don't want to do anything, university is there for you, TGM, Berufile, one of these you have to choose. Some people, that time is hardly you see any African on the road that doesn't go to school. And the atmosphere at that time was very fantastic. With the government, with the police, we don't have any problem. Everybody moves freely. The police are more friendly to the Africans. So, and that time it was very fantastic. So, only what I can say is that that time is more better, easy. You come here, you know how you go to university, you register with language school, after language school. So, what do you want to do? ATL, university, or Berufsule? The chance is there are many Africans need it. So, and myself, I was trained by Simon Kras Pauka. Simon Kras Bambao, Ubambao, and Wagambao. Now it's Siemens. Um, we are only four Africans there, four Nigerians, and one Tunisian. Since then, I don't think anyone, anybody, any Africa was there again till now. But it was very fantastic. Yeah, you talk about racism. That time, my own experience, the racism is not there. You don't look for apartment, you don't have a problem. Summer job is ready for you to do. Only now things changing in Austria, so that's it. Thank you. Okay. 
Thanks a lot. So uh, coming to you, I would like to ask you, you came to, yeah, maybe <laughs> hand over the mic, the yellow mic. <laughs> I guess you have to share it. Is that okay? <laughs> You came to Austria in the 80s, and um, when I skipped through the research material that Petja um, gave to me, there I found a quote by Karl Blecher, the then Minister of the Interior, uh, from the SPÖ as we know, who says, one would have to stop the asylum seekers from coming to Austria by using friendly deterrence. And some years later, Manfred Matzka would say, the situation for refugees in Austria must become so unbearable that no one wants to come here anymore. So what do you say? I mean, that, that was the time when you came here. How, how was the political climate? What were the most urgent concerns? Anyway, if I have to go back to 80s, as my brother said, he said things were, were really easy. I will also come to my own opinion. I will say really not too easy. <laughs> For you to come in here, you just really have to, if you are then, you, are, you just come here as a student and not, nothing else. Not these days that women come for other things or men for, to get money. But then we are all here to study then. And if you come to study, you must uh, satisfy your certificate to prove it that you are genuine to go into the university. Without that, it is not easy. Another something that I personally observed through even our own people, though I have been getting some negative something and also positive from Austria's side, I will also say there are some negative things. Then we have to go into this aspect and try to take the good things from Austria, also take the good things from us, and unite it, then it will be wonderful. We Nigerians, we were not really supporting ourselves. Then, if you come into this place, that was the first difficulties I have within the Africans, he said we can get an apartment, of course you can get, but also not so easy. Then my first apartment I got, then I got it through an African, a Yoruba man. First of all, I stayed with a, with an, an, a Yoruba man, married to my tribe woman from Benin. Then we st I stayed for two months. To get an apartment then, I got an apartment in Third District. But it was a Yoruba man. Then we don't even know this language. I didn't learn German before I came into this country. The Yoruba man corrected about, about, almost about three, the Yoruba man is still here today. If I have to look around, he corrected almost about three to five thousand shillings to, to, to get a medicity, per, permanent stay. I never knew, eighties, eight, eighties. collected about three to seven thousand shillings then. Our, our Naira then was really very heavy than that of European, uh, uh, it was not oral, it was shilling then. Our uh, Naira was about 28 to 30 something Naira to one shilling. A Yoruba man collected three to five thousand from me for just medicine. So it was not easy. Even then, we said, <laughs> <coughs> we said then there are some places in this slaughterhouse, they call it in German, where they kill uh, this uh, slacked house, they call it. Now, you, we, we Africans, we used to eat some parts, Austrian don't eat in, in, in this uh, cow. We like cow legs. <laughs> yeah, cow legs and shaki. So, Momo, they said it. And so then we used to go to Slack House. They throw them away, shaki. Like, shaki, you can buy it at a very cheap rate. Very, the whole shaki, at a very cheap rate. Then, Momo, they throw them away. Cow legs, they throw them away. Even our Nigerians will not take you there to go and collect it free. They won't, they won't show you. I, in my very, I was living then in first district. The first place I stayed two months with somebody was 12. My first apartment was in third district. In third district, I wanted to see a doctor, just a, a, a practical doctor. Uh, you know practical doctor? Yeah. My practical doctor, yeah. My doctor was right in my nose. Somebody took me from third district to 12th district. Ran around, after many years, I discovered that my practice I was right in front of me. So we were also difficult with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that is one of my... Any other thing you want me to talk about? Yes. Yeah, thanks for elaborating. I mean, there was a lot in it. So, but we will come back to that after the first round, I guess. All right, thank you. But thank you very much. If I have to come again, student then, I came with my own husband. I came to this country to study, both of us. Even at the university, I went first of all to Afro-Asia Institute because they gave me the information that Afro-Asia Institute 
is where most of the students meet, you know. I went to Afro Institute to ask where there is university. The university was right there at Chotinto, and somebody took me to First District. <laughs> so Sorry. we were difficult to accept. Thank you. Okay. Hello. <laughs> okay. Take the yellow one. You're allowed to take the yellow one. Okay. So you came in the 70s with your parents. So in the 90s, I guess you were already starting to be active uh, within the community. So, but I would be interested, what do you think, in which ways did your childhood, like growing up here, um, influence your social and political engagement? Um, compared to this gentleman and lady, I had no choice. I was brought here as a child by my parents, so um, I think uh, when it comes to racism and all these things, I think um, children can be pretty cruel. So I don't think the childhood was all that fun. I don't know what you guys experienced. I experienced a different uh, past. And, but one thing I learned from my parents was that I myself as a Nigerian, as a black girl, I represent all Nigerians. Therefore, please behave, be good, uh, don't do any bad things, and that's one thing I kept too. I tried to represent my people, and um, I guess that's a way of getting your child to do what, what you want it to do. So it's a good technique. <laughs> and, um, but in the end, in the long run, I discovered that um, a racist um, I cannot, I cannot with, with being a good person, with being a nice person, um, change a racist mind. And being bad or naughty will not make a person a racist in the long run. Yeah? So this is the thing I came to discover for myself. And of course, uh, I try to be good. So, <laughs> but... Um, one thing that was important for me was to, to enlift myself and um, empower myself and uh, try to find a way to, to empower others. And we, we, we formed groups like uh, SFC, for example, Black Women Community, and uh, we had a lot of different, different ways of empowering each other and uh, supporting each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we found it very important to read a bit of this book in case you don't know about it. He, the author, is one of the, the people that suffered from the police uh, repression against Africans that went to the street to demand their rights and an explanation to the death of Marcos Omofoma that was that died. I don't know which other word I should use. Uh, we believe he was murdered, and I believe he was murdered because he was on the on a deportation plane en route Nigeria through Sofia and he was bounded. He couldn't breathe, and as a result, he died of suffocation. So people went to the street, Africans and Europeans went to the street to, to speak out. So police took upon themselves, as they always do, the liberty to shut everyone off. He is one of the people that was put in prison he spent five years in there, among others, before his trial was even finished. So, uh, so what we heard now is like an account of the Operation Spring, uh, where hundreds of Africans were bucked and wiretaped and arrested and convicted of alleged drug offenses, and trials were going on for a very long time. So um, this also laid like the foundation of nowadays equitation of Nigerians with drug dealers. 
So, um, yeah, thinking about the 90s and the increase of refugees from Nigeria and Austria and also the intensification of foreign laws in various European countries, I would now really like to come to you because you are like grounded and based in self-organized uh, movements. So you came to Germany in the year 2005 and uh, what was the political situation in Germany you found yourself in and was the question of organizing already important for you by then? Yeah, thank you. And, um, first of all, I want to say good evening and to appreciate the audience. It's also impressive to see a lot of Africans also seeing this responsibility to write their stories. I think this project is a signal that if we are not able to write our stories, a lot of things will be swept under the carpet. So I will go back now to um, the old speakers. We had different stories, but I think what is happening today, what happened in the 90s was not new. It was just that everything was isolated, everything was silenced. So if we are able to go still deeper, to meet some other old persons. Maybe we could hear that even in the 50s, the first Africans who were somewhere else, they also got that. I arrived in Germany in 2005, and just as I arrived, I experienced Rijalo situation. Rijalo was an African guy who was burned to death in the police cell in Dessau. Years before, somebody else also was kicked to death in the same city, Dessau. So I think it's um, not a new story about racism. It's dated more than 500 years old. So it's just that it's happening in different levels and it depends on also this problem of ignorance is also still there because sometimes we try to ignore some things and we don't identify because we just want to move on. And it's also a problem of this um, comfort. You know? We just don't delve into it, let's just go this way and just be the good guy and let it be like that. So exactly that it is. I came to Germany with the orientation that Europe was um, a place where we could really learn about democracy. But just three days as I arrived in Germany as a persecuted person from Nigeria, just three days I saw another face of Germany. It was not like um, a process of respecting my fears, it was a process of even criminalizing me. So I think the history of criminalization of blacks is long, long, long before we were born. So in the 70s when our brothers and sisters came here, it's interesting to come to Europe as a tourist. That's why when you are asked a question on the train, um, where are you from? You say you are Nigerian, example. The next question is, how long are you staying? Because everybody wants to know whether you are leaving soon or you are coming to stay here. But today is a different case. Even those of you who are not even here as refugees who are here already working, you are all prejudiced as refugees. So every single black African is a refugee in this country. This is how it is seen today. This is the difference. So what I'm trying to say in effect is I came to Germany when I saw the first shock after three days, I confronted it because I felt, no, this cannot happen. I cannot be treated like a criminal and accept it. I have to resist it. So it was verbal restriction, resistance. And at the end of the day, it burnt me for four years in Germany. So I searched for political engagement myself because I realized instead of just saying, staying and waiting to be deported, I have to make this scandal about the situation in Germany. So if I'm talking about Germany, I'm talking about Austria because I think Germany plays a very strong role in Austria, so they control what is happening here. It's not much different. So what I mean is the self-organization we talk about is showing itself here, itself here right now because we should be able to write our story. If we are not able to write our story, we have nothing to leave behind for the next generation. I think this is the process we are facing now. Thank, Thank you. you. I think I would like to go in deeper um, because I'm, I mean, I, when researching, I watched some videos and I heard your speeches. I was really impressed and uh, I think it would be um, very nice also for the audience to hear more about your approach and your analysis 
when you um, link um, the economical and political structures, not only in the countries of origin, but also in the target countries. So, um, and you also uh, go to the point where you show that the authorities in Europe and in Africa are collaborating and are cre creating an unbearable situation for people. Could you talk about that maybe? Yeah. Today, it's really very difficult because I think what have we not done? I'm happy in my time to be able to do something that if I die, even if it's possible to live again, I should always be able to reflect that I was able to in my time leave something behind. We have done occupation, we have done different forms of protests, we have fought with police, we have gone to court with policemen. But what have we changed? Nothing has changed in Europe. It's just that all these processes have continued to demask the pretense of Europe and to show the racism in the society from the institutional level. And what can we do now? We just realized that, yes, this demand for equal rights for everybody is never possible in a culture of racism, like Europe, Germany, example. So now we are thinking about how can we really confront the real root causes why people are forced to leave their countries. Like my brothers and sisters talked about already, they came to study. There was respect also for them then because they were coming to spend money also here. Nigeria was having heavy Naira. It was equivalent to the pounds also. So when you are coming, you are coming with money and you are spending money so nobody is looking at you as coming to just pinch on the social pulse of Europe. But today is a different case. So that is why we decided, instead of thinking that we could find home here, there's no home here, here cannot be your home, home is home, we have to reflect back home. Then we started a campaign last time to say yes, we have to go to the root cause, that makes us radicals. Because when you go to the root cause of the issue, that's what the Germans call the Ursache, then you are radicalized. So this is the situation we face right now. So the main um, welcome culture that we see today in Germany, everything about the Nazi time was welfare state. Everything about today is welfare. We give you money, we control your life, we tell you what to do, we kill you when we want to kill you. It's not different. So at the end of the day, the welcome culture is giving a good face to Germany. A lot of institutions like the Catholic institution, the churches, they're all also responsible. It's like the system is killing you and the church is rubbing your head and say, take it easy, there's hope tomorrow, just pray to God. You know, this is what we face every day. So, but not until, but the people don't understand it. It's hard to understand. Even when you meet a refugee, he tells you, I don't have a right for asylum because there's no war in Nigeria. So it became questionable. Then why are people leaving their country? I remember I was born in the 70s. I could remember then we can buy Tom Tom, one cobble or two cobble. I could remember this when I was young. Um, nobody was coming here. A man is married to five women. He's driving a Vespa. He's working as a teacher. The children respect him well. The little he has to offer, they eat. He marries three wives, they live together. But why is it not possible now? So we have to understand this logic. So this is exactly how it is. But today is a different situation. We are coming here because it is everybody's right to move around in the globe. If you can, why can I not? The world was created for everyone. So these borders were created by humans, and why should these borders be there? It means there's something to hide. I make example with a cult like Ugboni in Nigeria. People get into this cult because they don't know what is happening in there. Everybody thinks if you are there, you can get to the top. At the end, when you get in there, you find out you're not getting to the top, you remain at the level, but you cannot tell. It's the same thing. The moment they started to create borders, people started to come in here more. But Europe does not want to show exactly the face of Europe that people are suffering here, that even Germans, Austrians, homeless ones are living. They don't want to show it to the other side of the world. They want to make Europe like paradise for everybody. This is the problem and we are here. But they talk about economic refugees and war refugees. What is, what, what is the difference between an economic refugee and a war refugee? If you produce weapons, if you flood our markets, 
with your junks, the Europeans like hench and bruised. But the fingers are sent to Africa. It's, it's a dumping spot. The refugees who are coming today now, they are creating new laws. The new laws is only meant, everybody seems happy to say, yes, we have opportunity to go to school as a refugee. You are just going to be exploited as in the labor market to secure the future rent for Germany and, and, and the entire Europe. That is exactly what is happening. So this is what we are trying to connect right now. We are trying to identify exactly the root causes of migration because I belong to a network whose motto says we are here because you destroyed our country. It's a slogan we've been using, but this slogan needed to be, you know, we needed to elaborate more on it for understanding. So that is why now we are trying to identify because when you make weapon, if you control the government in my country, and it's not working for you, the same weapon you use to create war, you create conflict. I use an example. When you produce a casket for the dead bodies, when every money you pray, God give me customers. So it means you want people to die. So if you produce weapons, then you also wish, God give me customers. So which means you want wars mm -hmm. so that you can sell your weapons. So it's even beyond war. We are saying whoever produces the instruments that aids violence, or exploit another country economically should be ready to harvest refugees. I think it's the English ad adage that says, when the land is no more safe, then the man puts the children in the waters. So that is what you see today. So this, the Europeans have to take and really accept it. Otherwise, there will be an occupation in Europe. That is the direction now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's quite tough now to make the bridge, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've seen now that um, there's really, yeah, there's a need for intergenerational um, conversation because we really have different perspectives on that. So, Coach, uh, you already talked about what happened when you, when you came here, and from what I know, you also started to organize yourself, but more on the community level, especially with, should I talk louder? No, Is, are you okay? <laughs> but especially like on the youth level and uh, also in sports. So what was behind that? Could you talk about more, more about your engagement in sports and um, um, yeah, you trying to um, educate the youth and to support them. Thank you. Yeah, there's nothing behind it. What I can only say is that then we are African, not Nigeria even. We are always almost together. We play football together, organize it. Until we start organ until then we have only African together we play football until later. We try to organize Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, Egypt, we play Africa Cup of Nations. So and it's very interesting because every Saturday, believe me, when you, then when you come to dinner yourself, you see a lot of people we play football, finally we sit down, drink beer, everybody go home. And that thing help a lot of people instead of roaming about on the street. When you are tired, we go home from home, maybe you want to go to pop or club, you can go. So there's no special secret about it than we organize ourselves then, well organized and well cooperative. Only now things change. Then we are more together, we help each other, unless you, want to, unless you don't want to help yourself. Because you will see somebody advise you, you want to go to, go to school, what do you want to do? They help you. But now, it's only you talk to somebody. Do you want to go to school? Somebody will have to reply you, I came here to look for money. I'm not here to go to school. They will tell you. So you'll be tired to, instead of you to talk to anybody, you'll be tired to talk to anybody again. So that's the problem. So there's no special anything behind it anyway. So we just try, then we organize ourselves. Well organized. But now, sorry, it's, religion is much important thing that uh, scatter everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, Adora, you also mentioned uh, when you started, you talked about SFT, and I also introduced you as one of the people who's really active in various organizations. And 
I will again ask what are the needs for this organization? So why did you decide to start separate organizations? And why was it important to organize, in your opinion? Actually, um, we started, for example, AfriCourt, the African Cultural Festival with dialogue program in which um, we created a platform for black people to present themselves in the way they wanted to present themselves, not in a way that um, um, the media, the politics uh, presented them. Because um, um, we started this because of the situation. Every black person, black man was a, was a drug dealer. Every black woman was a prostitute. I think you, you might remember Mr. Carver saying, um, wir sind machtlos gegen tausend Nigerianer. This speech of his, for example, saying that, um, that the Nigerians are all drug dealers. Um, my parents were not. And, <laughs> and uh, in, our, in our surrounding, we had hundreds of people that were not. Yeah? So for us, it was very important to, to show a different face of Africa. Africa is a huge continent with so many different languages, different, different uh, traditions. And, and with the Afrikult Festival, we managed to at least show a glimpse of the things. And we're still doing it till now, 18 years later. And um, another project that my sister and I started was um, a project for African youth, as I said we wanted to find a way to empower our youth, especially becoming a mother. I am a mother for children. I, I, was, I, I was trying to see what can we do for our children. And we created the, the mentoring program um, for uh, ch children with migrational backgrounds in politics. Uh, we had political mentors for those kids, for these young youths, and it was a very nice program. And we're still working it out how to make it better. Yeah, and another, um, I see two, three ladies from SFC, um, founders of FS SFC. This is an organization we founded as black women because young black women, because we saw there are so many groups. But there was nothing for us where we felt we fit in, yeah? So we just decided to be meeting and discussing and trying to, to find a way to discuss our problems and also enjoy um, our, our togetherness. And SFC has actually grown into a very big organization for, for, for women with their children, empowering their children. Because uh, when it comes to, to uh, what we learn in school, there's not much you learn about Africa. Okay, there's Egypt, wonderful, one high culture, uh, but there's so much more to it, yeah? And this is something that we're trying to, to implement in our children. Be proud of what you are, be, pr be proud of your heritage. And I think um, we're working and trying to see that it works. We're not that radical. Um, um, I used to be a bit radical, but not that much. Um, and I think it, there has to be a room for both, for um, aggression or let's say power work and 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 empowering ourselves yeah thank you i think you're absolutely right and it's just i mean this variety of things that we are doing just goes to show that we are developing various different strategies and i'm I would not be the person to say this one is right and this one is wrong. I think there are always situations where one fits and the other one not. And I think this is also a power of, of us. So coming to you in the last question, because I op before I open up the, the floor, um, I think this is especially what I see when I, when I look at what you have done, like this variety of various things. So. Um, there are many organizations you have worked in, you have tried it on the political level, on the community level. Why this aim to like, fight this political fight? I mean, 
what was my aim of going into this political yeah. line. Yeah. I would say right from home. Hmm? Yeah. Right from home, I didn't really like politics. I must be frank. Way back home to my country. Where I only tried politics way back home was a friend who was married to a politician. So I just have to go there to vote for him. That was all. <laughs> Coming to Austria, first of all, I discovered a lot of things. Starting, I started, first of all, with discussion, asking some questions. First, as my brother was saying that we were really very united in organizing, meeting ourselves Christmas time or New Year time, the Africans come together. Today I will do uh, uh, Christmas in my house. By New Year, come to my house. We were really getting together, and even then, if we have to cook, you see, I want to celebrate today, tonight. It, it, colleagues, other women will just come to us about four or five. They come to cook with me. Then they can even get dressed in my place, pack their dress and dress, and then the party will start. We were really very united. But the negative thing I was already saying then was about this. Uh, I think most, some of one or two of people that I met then, in Afro Asia Institute, I don't want to mention it, I don't want to point, mm -hmm. that who <laughs> was the way, then I was even thinking that maybe these people are doing this because I came later on to discover that German is difficult. I was not taking them serious as I'm now saying it, that the things is still, some of them, they're not really willing to, to be out. What I mean, when I came that time, I think I came because I was married home and half children home, and I was, I was coming, I was about a month, two months pregnant, you know? So when I came here, they put fears into me and my husband, and said, hey, this man, you are coming, we're Africans, finding them out in Afro. You are coming here with your wife at the same time to Europe. How could you make that? And I was so open. And I told them, as of now, I'm also even expecting. They said, really? To come to Europe with a pregnancy? Hey. First of all, he said, want your husband to come together. Then two, to come with a the pregnancy. They frightened me as a mother who loved children. I have to run, because there was no, no other means for me, to the hospital to, to destroy that baby. Mm -hmm. that, I have to run, because they put fears into me that you can't. So that one is what, that is. Then I was, when I go deep into politics, I do say the bad things which I experience here. But now I have to also talk about our people, the mixtapes we are making, so that we should know how to maybe change ourselves as well. Then again, even as a student then, we are some of us then, we are only three black women who were at the university. One Igbo, myself a Bini, and one, uh, one Yoruba lady who were students. No much women, but men were there. Those other women, we, they were with their wives. Then, you know what this is, stupendium. Then we, they didn't even tell you to go how you go about stipendium. So we end up, had some, there, some of them who have stipendium, we are there in the student time in Afro. We just have to go and rent a house. We don't know. I don't know German. If I have to ask for stipendium, how? They will not put you through. And many other things I mentioned before. No matter, then we started going on like that. What really pushed me into this uh, policy was that, then I started activities Seeing my own, with my own personal children at school, if not that I was a little bit intelligent, because myself I was a teacher before I, for years before I came down here. When I brought my children, so I, was, I had to brush myself with my dosh, the little I can take. When my children came down here, I really supported them. I stood behind them to make sure that their German is good. I put them in the school, morning till evening, the evening I go and feed them that they should pick, it's, uh, learn German. And then, the way they rate our certificate then, they downgrade our certificate. Whatever certificate you bring, you have to satisfy, uh, go and satisfy it. Then after satisfying, they will not give you the food, they will still reduce your years back. That was one. Then my children who comes, they have to start in primary one, they will tell them to go to a four school. Maybe you already six years to start primary school. Then you have to do the four mm -hmm. well, school first. Then it set my children about two years back. No, at the beginning, I was doing it with, with pleasure. I was doing it to put them. Later, I discovered that it was a setback to me and my children. Then I started engaging myself. When my children do I knew how I used to support them. If they have, they are, maybe they have two or one, they will, it will be difficult for them to give you one. They will only give you one when you, when you do sports, sports activities. <laughs> when it comes to the most important something is the German 
and mathematics. A little bit of English. Those mathematics and German. Then I stood. I'm good in math. I stood behind my children do this. But if they are going to be very good in their education, the the worst thing they don't give them to, they will never get one. It's three. I think then I started this uh, political activities at Flower Heads Day with women. Some of them are here today. They were they came to approach me because uh, I was doing some little information about uh, what is going on about other mothers, how what they also experience at school. Then I came to with these three only black to get in the school. The best one is three. They don't. They hardly get one. Only this most more sport and most more other things. They get one one. I said no, because I knew how I supported my children. Then I brought that matter to her, foul heads. Why is it that African uh, foreign children in mathematics and these two subjects are the things they will look at when you are going to the next step, to the next school, maybe gymnasium? And they try to follow this system when they're primary one because primary school is four years. One, two, from two, they started target, targeting you. Three, they will target you. That's where they will give you the three so that you cannot get to the to mat, to gymnasium. I don't have to go, so let me shorten up everything. So those things really motivated me to, to go into, to find out what is going on. I went into, and I came to discover, then I did also many courses to make sure that when I was at my event, I was also doing other courses to make sure that I have a job. But if you get a job, they will only give you cleaning, hotel. And when you have that job, I said, no, because I have the qualification, why this? Then I have to come to my own organization, build my own organization, 5th August uh, 1989, I built my organization. I have in mind that I am going to make sure that the women, we will make sure, then they will say if you are good in computer, they always go use computer. And computer then is very, very expensive if you want to do the course. Then I said, now I am going to do that course, typing on computer for our women and men. Because we as a Nigeria, if you think about us, we are so difficult to, to do things. If you are doing politics, our men will think, you are going to spoil their women, they will not allow their women to come. So I tried to organize my, my organization. It was difficult for me as a family, man, women, and children. Because children have their problem, men have their children, their problem, and women also have their problem. That was how I did it. But still, today, I'm disappointed with my people. I'm losing my political interest because I knew how I fought deep. Even I was the first Abata Kamarete for four years for the history of Australia today. I went to the Abata Kama. Let me round up. I went to the Abata Kama to take about 120 quadrimeters to call my people to listen to their problem. We were, they, they, none of them turned up, and only few. Mm. So just let me stop it. So we Africans, about the churches, what you said about, we go to the church. Do you know that the churches use these difficulties we are having through our visa, through your, your whatever problem you have, they use it to preach for you so that you think that God will help you. No way. So thank you. <laughs>